I know the ghosts loved it. Um, <laughs> And I hope you guys loved it as much as I do. I, I, I saw the film at uh, Full Frame uh, Documentary Film Festival last year, or earlier this year, I guess. Um, and I and I texted um, Robert about it to just tell him how much I loved it. And, and one of the things I said, which which I, is that I feel like it's a film that's very much about history and about amnesia, which I think is a, is a kind of U.S. United States affliction if you will, but how um, it's not really gone, even if we can't seem to remember it or recall it or pay attention to it, it's all there. And I think one of the things that's wonderful about the film is the way in which that history comes alive through the townspeople reenacting and they kind of, they truly do get in touch with, with what must have been, what it must have been like to live through that time through you coming in to do this reenactment. So I just think it's an amazing accomplishment as a film. So um, kudos to you, sir. Um, so I'm curious to, uh, when you encountered this town, did you feel like it was a town that um, had some real connection to its history or or it was absent and you knew about it and you know what 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 prompted you to want to um, inflict yourself on these people? <laughs> nice choice of words. Documentary filmmakers inflict themselves on people. Um, well first of all thank you for doing this. Thanks for staying and I want to just acknowledge um, what, that's the alarm saying the movie's done. <laughs> you guys the movie's done. Uh, I have an alarm set so we can drink. Um, I just want to acknowledge my producer, Bennett Elliott, who's here. The, the film was highly collaborative with you. By Bennett, um, who's very shy and doesn't often like to get up here and talk about this stuff, but I might throw you some questions because, you know, half of them are your answers. Um, yeah, I think they, yeah, you can't help. If you're in Bisbee, you, well, first of all, so the, the mines closed in 1975. So if you're in Bisbee today, there's only two reasons. One, you're an old mining family that has a deep connection to the place, which usually means a deep connection to the company or the companies that, that ran the place. Um, or, and you love it, you, you know, because still, even mining families that love the that were connected still left. Um, the, or you're one of people like Lori McKenna, who's in the film, and the artist who's doing the rubbings, or other people who come in for, you know, you know, cheap rent and for a place to make art and a place to be connected into to the desert in, in a unique way. So Lori is from the Northeast and she comes from a union family and the way she wanted to work was to go to the desert and be reconnected to something deeper. So you get, you know, hippies and artists and bikers and weirdos all moving into town because of the cheap rent and, you know, the fact that there's barely an economy and it's sort of on the edge of the world in some ways. Um, at least for the American sense of the world. Um, but you can't, when you walk down the streets of Bisbee, that's the same post office that was there 100 years ago where they were rounded up. Um, the, every building has a story. The, the, the sense of ghosts being in town is a real thing. Uh, and yeah, I think the, the town really does um, care about its history. At the same time, I, I love what you said at first about the amnesia because um, it's, it's a, the mentality of a company town, there's all these vested interests in not talking about the, you know, these things. For Sue Ray or Richard, both of whom had family members on both sides of deportation, it was a trauma. It was a real, like a real moment of tearing their families apart. And they tried to talk about it in some sense, but no one wants it. It's, it's not a polite discussion when when what you're actually saying, it'd be like saying, hey, can I really quickly talk about how you did something to me? Right, right. And we're supposed to be friends, and this town is so small by this point, you know, there's only 5,000 people in town. At the, at the height, Bisbee had 25,000 people in town. So it's been diminished to this core group of people, and so there's this sort of polite thing of not bringing it up. But then the deportation centennial comes along, and people start to be ready. So when we came into town, people were ready already, you know, and they were and, and they were engaged and they wanted to sort of, yes, we're glad you're here because we have shit to say. Yeah, that's great. So you talked about some of the folks in it, and, and 
clearly the family that had brothers on either side of this are, are it's clear why you would gravitate to that family to want to be in your film or the reenactment of, of what went on. What, what went into your calculations about other um, people to play roles and who you as a filmmaker maybe thought you were going to focus on going in? Did it work out to be who you ended up focusing on or were there some surprises? Yeah, so the reason why I made Bennett and our other producers, Doug and Susan from Fourth Row Films, I made all their life hell because we the way the film had to work was we we had these scripted scenes that were based on the historical record that were like you know there's the IWW meeting there's the walkout there's you know X Y and Z and and we sort of we worked with a historical advisor who is one of the like the sort of you know preeminent uh, historians on the deportation and sort of crafted these scenes some of which are in the movie some of which aren't and those had to have you know the normal sort of scheduling of you know costumes and extras and all that stuff but i would refuse to cast the film until we did the good journalism the documentary work that meant that you know would result in the right cast for me not anyone can play john c greenway one of the chief villains of the deportation and then we met james west and and but it was like Okay, well, James is an actor, and he's a little cheesy weirdo guy. And he, he actually, it's funny because you have all these non-professionals. He's the worst actor in the movie. By far. And then, uh, but he's the one of the best at revealing. But he's great. But he's one great of the movie. Well, he's one of the best at revealing what he really thinks. Yes. And and the way we the way we worked with James, and this is sort of indicative of how we cast the whole film. So. Jay, I was just like, Bennett, we don't really want to meet with an actor, right? Like, that sounds terrible. He's going to be awful. And, and then we, he sat down, and he's this big, hulking guy. And he's just like, yeah, I want to act. And I was like, oh, cool, whatever, man, you know. Um, but I also worked in private prisons and have deported people. And it's like, oh, good, you can be the villain. Like, that's, that's easy. And he's like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, we're going to use all your real stuff to make the character more interesting. He's like, oh, that sounds cool, you know? like. That sounds different, you know. So it was that kind of thing where it was like every every character, you know, needed. We the, the the final scenes don't work unless you care about the people who are performing those roles, and you're not. It, they don't work if you're not thinking through watching people process, right. you know. And if you're not, if you don't care about who they are, you're not going to care about what they're processing, right? So yes. all of the casting had to be you know, connections to the past or have other sort of relationships, and then they get to be the roles. Right, and Fernando is sort of the sort of moral center of this mm -hmm. film, and, and emotional center too. Was he someone that you knew was going to be a, a real central character, or did he kind of emerge for you? Well, that? I'm really glad that Bennett's here to, to hear this story that she gets to hear all the time, which is just proof that directors don't know what they're talking about 90% <laughs> of the time. So I saw Speak for yourself. I, <laughs> Let's interview your producers and see what they think. Um, uh, uh, they're not going to get everything. So I saw a picture of Fernando because we, one trick if you're making a film about a small town, get become friends with the real estate agent in small town because they A, know where everyone lives and whatever. They also have a vested interest in you succeeding. So if you're like need something, they'll be like, we can make that happen. It will help, you know, it'll help property values basically if they make a movie here. You know, especially in a place like Bisbee. They're so naive. They they really the documentaries <laughs> help no one. Um, but uh, but uh, so so this really wonderful woman Eliza um, Bennett had connected with Eliza, and I and I just wanted a, a Mexican minor basically, just like as a um, for the early shoots, the first shoot, I wanted like just to see as almost like a test. Like, if we dress someone up and have them walk through town, what will happen? Will it look stupid? Will it work? What, what will happen? And I was like, but it has to be a Mexican, because that's one of the chief characters will be a Mexican minor. And and they sent this picture of Fernando, and he's obviously drop-dead gorgeous and magnetic and all this. And I saw it, and I was like, he's too pretty and skinny. And but it was like, you're an idiot. He's, he's definitely the right person. And, um, and basically, he only said yes because Bennett's cool, and um, and he he walked up the hill the morning we shot with him. I was like, this guy's interesting. And then you turn the camera on, you're like, oh my god! And and then and then we just did a shoot that's not in the film where he's standing, he's dressed up as a miner, and 
he's standing in front of the, the pit, and he just starts crying. And he says, well, my boyfriend just broke up with me, and we used to go watch the sunset here. Nothing else. There's no explanation. It's not like, I gotta tell you about my boy. It's like, it's just like simple, and he just sits there and waits for us to ask him a question. And there's just something like, oh my God, the depth of feeling and what he's dealing with. I don't even know what he's dealing with. And, and I was just like, we'd like to make a movie with you. <laughs> like, you're, and he's like, oh, okay, well, let's see what happens, you know. And everything was chill. And then by the end, he's yelling, we are the IWW. And it's like, cool shit. Yeah, he really goes through something in this film. And, and I think you're right. It's, it, there's an interesting sort of tension between him being utterly contemporary. He feels utterly contemporary. I didn't know he was gay, but it's not surprising. He, you know, there's something about him that makes you believe, on the one hand, he's not who he's playing. On the other hand, he's very much a person of this moment who's going through this process of trying to rediscover something that he has very personal connections to because of his mother. He has very personal connections to what this story is about, too. And it's really, it's really powerful. Well, and the most important thing about Fernando is that he had built up this sort of wall, you know, to deal with those traumas, to deal with what happened to his mother, to deal with what he right. has dealt with, being gay, being an outsider in a lot of ways, yeah. being, of, having of two identities. A lot of people who, who are on the border especially, but all over the country obviously, deal with two identities, and they're balancing the identities. I'm yeah. Mexican, I'm an American. He was born in Tucson, grew up in Naco, Sonora loves Bisbee because of what it frees him to be. And in the process of going through this film, I hope you all cringe when I corrected him when he can't say the word solidarity. I hope everyone was like, ooh, that's a real bullshit thing to happen. Like, because I, I cringe when I saw the footage and I was like, well, it has to be in the film because it's cringy. You know, like, it's an Anglo outsider making this film about trying to move this guy forward. But ultimately, the end of the movie to me is, when you know your history, and you know your connection to the other histories, your personal history and how it connects to broader history, you could be empowered by that or you could be, you know, haunted by that. And to me, that's what the final scene is, even though we shot it sort of not knowing what it would mean. To me, the final scene is he, I don't know where he stands. And, and I can tell you, post film, he's fine and everything's great and he's, you know, supportive of the film and he's a friend. But while we were making it, it was like, are we opening up trauma or are we helping? Right, right. And, and, and you never know, and that's the central question of the movie. Do you bury ghosts or do you exercise them, you know? Yeah, so. Um